This is the final lecture on foraging behavior in birds, and we're going to investigate the topic of optimal foraging. In any study, when you're trying to address the adaptive nature of a behavior, you're basically trying to understand how that behavior maximizes fitness. So from the perspective of foraging, we're trying to understand how animals would forage in an optimal manner. So that means they have to make appropriate decisions on what type of food items to eat. And then once they've done that, what if there's size variation in the, that food item, uh, what is the, the best size uh, to uh, choose? Where do you forage? Uh, and, and a variety of other uh, variables that they have to take into consideration. So let's walk through some examples of optimal foraging studies uh, in uh, animals. This one is dealing with northwestern crows. Northwestern crows uh, forage on mollusks, uh, whelks, that they drop onto uh, the rocky shores um, in coastal environments to break open the shell so that they can get at the uh, soft parts uh, of, of the whelk. So the first question is, well, what size whelk do they uh, choose? And observations of them show that they just choose the largest whelks available. They also, one of the other questions is, well, how high do they have to fly to drop the whelk? Can they, you know, go way up high so they get maximum velocity uh, and, and drop the whelk? Uh, but if they do that, if they fly too high, there's a chance if it, it breaks down below, a competing rival crow will swoop in and get the prey. Okay, so that's a concern. If you go, if you, if you stay too low, though, it, it'll take too many times dropping it before it finally cracks open. So there has to be some optimum uh, with regard to uh, uh, drop height. And so what what they have found is that they only drop large whelks from about five meters in height. Now the figure here is actually an experimental study in which they constructed a tower uh, over some rocks and they dropped whelks a number of times of different sizes a number of times to see when they would finally break. And uh, here you see the best fit line uh, through each of these whelk sizes. And if you look here where they normally would be dropping it, it makes sense that, that apparently the birds have already done the experiments of their own and figured out if you're only going to feed on large whelks, basically fly up five meters and drop them because that will minimize the number of times that you have to drop it, but it's also close enough where you don't have to, uh, you can get to it quick enough where com competitors won't steal it from you. Now, obviously, if large whelks are rare, there would probably be other choices. Uh, the, the birds would probably choose medium whelks or small whelks, uh, and the drop height of those would be different. And that would be predicted from the data shown here, because basically the, the point at which you're um, looking at the, the, the best drop distance is when this line starts to, to really flatten out. Let's look at data on another species of bird called oyster catchers that feed on mussels. If you just look at the profitability of mussels of different sizes, it appears that large mussels have the highest caloric uh, gain per unit effort. However, if you really start looking at this in more detail, you find out that some of the largest mussels actually have a lot of uh, barnacles and uh, other things growing on them that makes it exceedingly difficult to get them open and so that really devalues um, the the value of some of the largest ones and so the initial estimate of profitability in model A didn't take that into account and when you have model B it is actually taking that account and so muscles in the in the range of uh, 50 appear to be the best uh, again assuming these are really readily available but if you also look at availability, uh, in addition to uh, which ones are difficult to open and the caloric value of the different sizes, uh, you have to shift that pr prediction to uh, uh, predicting that they would prefer muscles in the range of uh, 30 to 45 millimeters. And here is a figure that just shows what at one study site the muscle uh, uh, frequency was of muscles of different sizes. 
So when you put that all together, again, you, you come up with a prediction of uh, they should pick those between 30 and 45. And if you actually look at the muscles that were selected by the birds, uh, it fits that prediction quite well. You know, it looks like the peak here is around uh, the upper 30s. So one of the decisions an animal has to make when it's uh, trying to determine how to eat is whether to forage as a generalist or forage as a specialist. And the general rule is if the best prey item is really common, well then specialize. Just eat that. Um, why waste any of your time searching or handling uh, less profitable prey items? But what happens if it ends up that the best prey items are not very common? Well, in that situation, you probably want to uh, gradually become more and more generalist. And I have a picture here of uh, a platter, a, a bowl of peanuts, a sports bar, and I guarantee you, everybody in this room that's ever been in this circumstance, you have made this transition. You sit down to the, the bowl at first and you specialize because there are a lot of uh, big peanuts in there that have you know threes, maybe the occasional four uh, per, per peanut. And so you're getting more bang for your buck there. But as the night progresses, um, if the bowl isn't filled up, you end up with the remaining individuals being less and less uh, profitable and you end up just grabbing whatever is there. Let's look at another uh, situation in which birds uh, are challenged to forage optimally. Starlings, when they're adults they, uh, and nesting, have to gather prey in one location and then decide uh, how to maximally deliver uh, prey to their nestlings so that they can maximize the number of offspring produced. Basically what they're trying to do here is maximize the prey delivery rate. So let's just talk about kind of what some of their options would be. An individual could fly to a field, get a single prey item, and return to the nest. Well, in this situation, they're really delivering too little food per unit time, and there's a lot of cost associated with the traveling uh, uh, itself as far as energy expenditure and the time associated with that travel. So that's probably not the best option. Well, they could spend a lot of the time at the food source and, and go ahead and gather up as much food as they could possibly carry in their bill and take the largest load possible. Well, but if you take too many prey in your bill, there becomes a point when there's diminishing foraging success for a couple of reasons. One, as you kind of deplete the patch around you, increased time in foraging is going to lead to less and less success at actually finding the very rare remaining prey items in that location. And the other thing is, once your bill gets to a certain load, every time you bend over to pick something, pick one up, maybe two fall out. And so there's this diminishing return with uh, uh, additional effort. So that's probably not the best bet either, to, to wait until you get the largest possible load. So there's got to be some intermediate that is the optimum that uh, is, is best for maximizing the delivery rate. How do they figure this out though? Well, there's several variables that they have to take into account. Travel time associated with the distance to the nest, that's one of the things that we'll see is going to be important. And that diminishing return rate on foraging efficiency with increased prey load in the bill and increased time looking for additional prey. This is represented in what's called the loading curve. And we're going to see that finding the solution to this is, is easy for us because we can do it graphically. Okay, here's basically what we're talking about. A graphical representation of trying to figure out what's going on here with starlings. We have two x-axes here. On the right is search time. On the left is travel time. And the y-axis is load, which is basically a representation of how many prey items are gathered up by the bird. The uh, dotted curve uh, here in the, the right part of the figure is what we call the loading curve. So the loading curve basically shows that initially with additional search time you rapidly can increase the load that a starling can uh, uh, carry. But 
toward the end of the, the right-hand side of this x-axis, additional time um, doesn't really get you much as far as an increased load. That's where we're talking about this diminishing returns. And there's going to be a different loading curve for different uh, habitats. But let's say that these birds are returning to one habitat, but some birds have nests a long way away, and some birds have nests that are relatively a short distance from the search uh, site, from the foraging site. Well, the, the birds, depending on how far away they are having to fly to deliver the, the prey to their nestlings, will have different optimal short and long um, loads and search times. So let's talk about it from the perspective of the uh, short distance traveler. You draw a straight line from the distance from the nest to the foraging area. That's what's represented here as travel time. You draw a straight line from that location to where it's just tangential to the loading curve. Where it touches, you can then go down to the x-axis. That tells you the optimal search time. And you can go across to the y-axis, and that tells you the optimal load for an individual that just has to travel that short distance. You draw a similar line going from the long distance, and you see that it is tangential with the loading curve in a different spot. Again, drop down to the x-axis and it tells you that you're going to have an additional search time if you have to go this long distance and this is basically the best and go across to the y-axis and you see that you're better off if you're going a long distance uh, needing to um, carry a slightly heavier load. So this is how graphically you can figure out given a loading curve and giving certain uh, search times and travel times you can graphically figure out what is the optimal for different distances and travel times. Well, there are certain key assumptions in making these estimations. One is that this is an adaptive strategy, that natural selection has molded these starlings to be good foragers, and that the currency that they're trying to optimize is the rate of prey delivery. And that makes sense because the prey rate delivery is, is really uh, an important factor responding to selection in most birds because that it determines uh, how many birds will successfully fledge from a nest. And, and again, that's, that's a, a good measurement of fitness of the adults. We also have to make sure that we have constraints of prey delivery rate uh, effectively included in the model. So the travel time, the loading curve has to be accurate. And we also have to, the, the birds have to have some degree of information uh, processing, uh, meaning they have to have some rule of thumb. I mean, obviously the birds aren't able to graph these things out and mathematically calculate what the optimum is in each of these cases, and they may have to have a few trial and error uh, sampling periods uh, flying back and forth before they can kind of figure out what is the best load. And, and that's what I mean by a rule of thumb, because uh, everybody in this room, if you do shopping uh, at a grocery store and have an apartment, um, maybe on a second or third floor, you develop these rules of thumb. Okay? And you don't, you don't need a calculator to do this, but you kind of figure out, okay, if I take X number of bags at a time, I can kind of minimize my energy and time to, to get this process finished. And, and the same thing can happen in other animals as well. Now, animals may not always forage optimally due to certain constraints, such as predation. They may not forage optimally and instead adopt a risk-averse behavior. So here's some data showing this with dugongs uh, or sea cows. They have a preferred foraging behavior where they basically uh, take their muzzle and kind of uh, disrupt the, the, uh, the substrate of, of the ocean there to, to try to find their uh, prey, invertebrate prey, but this causes a lot of uh, uh, sediment to to come up and it's harder for them to see. So when there are a lot of sharks around, they don't like to do that. They take a, a more safe, effective method, which they're not gonna be as good getting food that way. But again, they're just uh, being risk averse. There was actually a study that tested 
this kind of behavior in squirrels where they fed uh, squirrels cookies and the squirrels would take the cookies to trees for safety when the trees were close because the cost of the behavior was relatively low if the tree was just right there and the benefits of safety uh, according you know to what the the squirrels were thinking was relatively high if you take those cookies farther and farther away then you would see a shift in the behavior if the the squirrels felt safe they would more likely just to eat the cookie there uh, so that they could be uh, at the location where they could eat another cookie uh, instead of spending all this time going back and forth. Similar uh, data associated with this concept dealing with chickadees. Uh, chickadees in this one study would carry seeds to, to a safe area for foraging about uh, after seeing a hawk. Uh, so if you just look at their base behavior here, if you're looking at distance from, from cover, if they were really close to cover, um, they would typically carry the the uh, uh, seed to that cover to forage, uh, either before or after the hawk. And that's basically the same pattern with the squirrel and the cookies. But as you move farther and farther away from cover, um, before they saw a hawk, they felt fairly safe, and they would basically very rarely take the seeds to cover. They would just eat it there so they could be at the location, the foraging location, to get some more seeds. But you see that after a hawk was flown over the area and they had some uh, perceived uh, threat, they were uh, much more likely to go ahead and carry uh, that food to cover. So uh, again, they would adopt a risk-averse behavior. On the other uh, side of the coin, um, animals will tend to adopt a risk-prone behavior as their hunger level increases. So bluegill sunfish have a foraging site preferences that will change depending on the presence or absence of largemouth bass. They will basically forage farther away from cover uh, in the absence of bass, but kind of restrict their foraging to covered areas uh, if they uh, sense the, uh, the presence of, of a predator. But they're more likely uh, to extend this the risky behavior foraging in uh, uh, more open areas if they're uh, in a starved condition. Well, what are some of the values associated with taking an optimality kind of modeling approach to understanding animal behavior? Well, these types of studies uh, make sure that, that we are uh, identifying the correct crucial variables and the correct currency and constraints that animals have to deal with when foraging. It tests the sensitivity to different situations, uh, the effects of predation, uh, motivation, uh, things like hunger. And when done correctly, these models can make explicit testable predictions uh, that force, the, this forces researchers to focus on specific issues and think very uh, specifically and clearly. But there are limitations to optimality theory in, in taking this type of approach. Um, sometimes you uh, see that the animals are foraging in ways that, that deviate from your model predictions. And then you have to basically go back to the drawing board and figure out, um, did I use the wrong currency? Maybe maximizing caloric intake isn't the only uh, situation to, to think of. There could be uh, um, uh, certain um, important nutrients that are required as well. Uh, this has been shown in, in moose that they can maximize their energy foraging on uh, terrestrial plants, but they have to get uh, certain salts from aquatic plants. And so they, they actually forage in the aquatic habitat more than you would expect if you were just modeling uh, the currency based on energy. Also wrong constraints. Uh, you have to make sure that you're understanding the constraints as far as things like handling time. Perhaps there are age or sex related differences. Maybe males and females forage differently or young versus older individuals forage differently. How much environmental variability is there and how does this affect change in foraging behavior through time? And then also what is the information processing of the animals involved? Um, especially if the environment is, is varying, um, do the animals have enough time to form a, a rule of thumb that will allow them to make uh, adaptive decisions? Or have you designed a study that takes that into consideration? So to review, 
Optimal foraging studies examine foraging behavior of animals uh, in the context uh, of, of saying that they're going to maximize a specific currency. And again, typically that means we're trying to look for net uh, calories uh, as, as maximizing that. Some of the food choice variables that are examined typically in optimal foraging studies, uh, food size, uh, handling time, the availability of, of food at different sizes, and how these all uh, can be modeled to predict how the animal will behave. Foraging behaviors of animals vary between generalists and specialists depending upon the availability of preferred food items. So um, if preferred food items are really common, organisms should specialize and become more and more generalist um, as the specialized um, uh, food, the, the, the most profitable food, uh, is, becomes rarer and rarer. We looked at how you can model the optimal load for provisioning nestlings at a nest, uh, and uh, the exact answer to that varies based on several uh, variables, uh, but predictive models can be produced. Predators um, affect condition-dependent foraging behaviors. So some animals in certain circ circumstances will adopt risk-prone versus risk-averse behaviors. And uh, starvation will make animals more likely to adopt risk-prone versus uh, risk-averse behaviors. And then lastly, we talked about the fact that optimality models, uh, because they're so specific, they do have a, a lot of benefits for testing hypotheses but they do have limitations as well if you don't understand the biology of the organism you're trying to model initially. And you may have to go back to the drawing board a couple of times to get things right.